Well, good evening, Athens. It's good to be here with you this warm Friday afternoon. I can't believe that uh, April's yeah, almost they, they gone, huh? April's almost out of here. Fixing so to move into May. Spring is definitely up. here. Starting to get warm. A lot of people there. And we're thankful for that. So we're going to continue to share with you tonight from God's Word and about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read to you in the book of Mark. It's Mark's Gospel. Uh, this is probably the oldest gospel as far as when it was written and many think that mark uh, gathered this information mostly from peter from his experiences with jesus and he wrote it down and so that's kind of just a little history about this book this is uh, the gospel according to mark it says in the beginning or the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ so that tells us a lot right there that that mark is starting to tell us about jesus earthly ministry this is where it, it all started. He's going to start at the beginning, basically, with John the Baptist. Let's read what it says. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So right off the bat, what he does, he establishes what his purpose in writing this gospel is. His purpose is to show or reveal or exhibit that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he... He goes on in his in his gospel here, and he does just that. He lays out the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says this. He says, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. That's a reference to Malachi three one in the Old Testament. Then he says in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's a, that's a reference to Isaiah 43. You see, Mark is starting his, his gospel off by referencing back to the prophets and saying this Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth is fulfilling these prophecies from the Old Testament. So that's the way he begins his gospel. Small, small engine. You know. That's the way he begins it is by showing us there. and revealing to us that this man, this you know, God-man, Jesus know. Christ, is fulfilling the Old Wait, Testament pro prophecies about who the Messiah is. No. <laughs> so here we go. Oh, look. He says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a, ba a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And now John, John was kind of a weirdo. John would have been, y'all would think John was really stranger than we are probably. He was really weird. He says he was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. See, when people came to the Jordan, to see John baptizing people, they would have thought, what a weirdo. Who is this crazy guy out here dressed in camel's hair and eating wild locusts and honey and telling people they need to be baptized for the remission of sin? This was especially offensive to Jews. The reason it was especially offensive to Jews is because back in that time, before Jesus began his ministry, before he was crucified, the noise of the there was a baptism that Gentiles went through if they wanted to, be, to be, uh, become Jews. They had to go through a baptism, which was a, a, a picture of them being cleansed from their uncleanliness, their sin. And the Jewish people didn't have to do that because they considered themselves already to be clean. So when John the Baptist comes out and says, you must be baptized for the remission of sin, naturally these Jews were highly offended. So see, John was one who stirred the pot, if you will. He went against the grain. He was different, but he obeyed God. He was, he was a weird guy. And he was preaching, saying this, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So here's John saying, I'm baptizing you with water. But he's speaking of Jesus. How are you doing? Can I help you? All right. That's all right. Just kind of sneaking around behind me. I just don't want to be on the camera. Oh, well, it's 360, so you're going to be on unless you're right behind me or behind that pole. <laughs> you're not going to hit me in the head, are you? No, I still want to be on camera. 
That's fine. You know, you know, there's a there's cameras all over the place, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to arrest you for anything though. So you get in more trouble with them than me. Okay. Fair enough. No worries. No worries. I'm not either. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Josh. Josh, I'm out. It's good to meet you, Josh. What? Okay, cool. Oh, I get that. No worries. Alright, where were we? Let's see here. We're talking about John the Baptist. He came out preaching that people need to get baptized for the remission of sins. And he says that I may baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Speaking of Jesus, of course. Then it says it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, which was the Father, of course, saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And it says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now you can go read in other Gospels more detail about the temptation of Christ in the wilderness by Satan. And, and Mark just kind of mentioned it. He, he doesn't go into great detail. But basically what happened was that Jesus came, and John didn't want to baptize him. He said, who, he's basically saying, who am I? to baptize you. And Jesus says that we need to do this because it's, it's what we're supposed to do. It's fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament again. So John baptizes Jesus when he comes out of the water. The Spirit, like a dove, descends on him and the Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So God the Father came and announced, if you will, that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, that He is the Christ. And they weren't alone out there. It wasn't just Jesus and John out there at, at the Jordan when this happened. There was many Jews and people, as we just read, that, that all of Judea came out to be baptized in John. So this was a very public scene when this happened. So Jesus' is baptism, his incarnation, if you will. I wouldn't call it his incarnation. It's his, uh, the beginning, I guess, of his earthly ministry, you could say. But it was, it was seen... And it was viewed by many people. So it wasn't done in secret. Many things, you know, many false religions, their beginning seems to be in secret. Take uh, Mormonism, for instance. Joseph Smith, supposedly, if I remember right, he supposedly goes out into the woods or something somewhere, and he, he see, gets this seer stone or something, tablets, all by himself, and he writes down the Book of Mormon. It's a very secret, private matter. But everything Jesus did, you'll see if you study it, everything he did was done very publicly. Even his crucifixion was a very public event. It wasn't done in secret. It was out there for the world to see everything that he did. So he is very different from other supposed deities or religions. But anyway, so he was tempted for 40 days by Satan in the wilderness. And the Bible tells us in other places that Jesus was tempted in all ways you and I are, but without sin. So see, many people think, well, he's God, of course, you know, he can do all this. But Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be tempted just like you and I are tempted. The only difference is, is when we give in to temptation, we fall into sin, he never sinned. He never violated God's law. Never, not even in thought. Think about that. He was perfect, the perfect God-man. In verse 14 and 15, it's really interesting. It says, Now after John was put in prison, you know, John was arrested and beheaded, but after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, here's what Jesus was preaching. He was saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So that was the message of the Messiah, of Jesus. That's what he came to preach, is to repent and believe the gospel. And you know, that's the same message today, even 
More than 2,000 years later, the message has not changed. The message is still the same. The message today still is to repent and believe the gospel. What does this mean exactly? Well, repent is a word you don't hear very often in, in America, even in American churches, because we're afraid to offend someone. But repentance is the 180 doing the change of action. It's forsaking your sin, turning from it, and turning towards God. But it's more than that. See, repentance literally means to change your mind, to change your attitude about sin, to agree with God that it is sin. So it's not just self-improvement. We're capable as human beings to improve ourselves, morally speaking. For instance, you can, you can stop being a drunkard. I did before God saved me. You can stop fornicating. You can, you can stop doing many things and morally become better, if you will, without God or without believing in God. We can do that because God has wired us in a way that we can change our actions. So repentance is not just a change of action. It's not a legalistic, stop doing this, stop doing this, start doing this, start doing this. But it's a whole change of mind and attitude. The Bible says if anybody's in Christ, that old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. That He takes out your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh with new desires. There's repentance, those new desires. See, when you when you repent and you change your mind and God grants you this repentance, you decide and you, you, you realize that, that sin is a bad thing. That it's very simple, that it's not good. It's fun, yes. It, it helps the flesh to feel good, but it's it's sinful. It's a violation of God's law, transgression of the law. You're sinning against the very one who created you. So see, when you repent, your whole mindset changes. And you no longer love your sin. You no longer maybe go seek it out, but you hate it. When you stumble and fall, as all believers do, we all struggle with different things. We're not perfect. But our whole attitude is different when we stumble and fall and we sin. It grieves us. It grieves the Holy Spirit. So what do we do with that? Well, First John tells us that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's what believers do with sin. We're not perfect. We're not, we're not preaching a sinless perfection to you. In fact, the Bible tells us that if you say you don't have sin, that you're a liar and the truth's not in you. So we're, we're not saying that by no means, but it's your attitude towards it. Is there a struggle? Is there a war going on inside you against sin? First John tells us to run to the cross, confess our sins, ask for forgiveness, and when we do, that Jesus forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But that's repentance. It's more than just self-help improving your moral standing, if you will. It's changing your whole mind and attitude, which results in what? It results in a change of action, right? So you can change your actions, but if it doesn't come from a change of mind, change of heart, then it's, it's nothing more than legalism. Nothing more than legalism. And what's your motive for changing? Are you, are you trying to be better and do better to make your mother happy, make your father happy, to stay out of trouble? Or do you desire to change and do better because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did to honor and obey and please Him? So that's repentance. It's turning from sin. Your whole mindset of sin towards sin changes. That's why the Bible says He takes out this heart of stone and gives us that heart of flesh with new desires because our new desire is to obey and honor Him. Then the second thing Jesus said, He said, repent. Then He said, and believe in the gospel. Believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, this, you know, Mark started off by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talk about the four gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The four accounts of the, the earthly life of Christ, if you will. But what is the gospel? We ask many people a lot of times what the gospel is. Many professing believers, and most of the time, believe it or not, most of the time, even professing believers have a hard time 
explain what the gospel is. Just giving the simple gospel. They have a difficult time doing that. Why is that? Shouldn't we know what the gospel is if we're followers of Christ? The answer is yes, by the way, we should. But you know, because salvation is an act of God. Jesus said, nobody can come into me unless the Father first draws him. So see, God has to initiate this salvation process. And God even grants us repentance. He gives us faith. So it's really all about Him. It's not about us. But we need to understand what the gospel is. How do you believe in something if you can't even articulate what it is? It's kind of weird, but what is the gospel? There's a good explanation that uh, Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15. It's kind of the simple gospel. Actually, 2 Corinthians 5.21, which God used Paul also to write, says, this is the gospel in a sentence, if you will. He says, He who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, this Jesus the Christ we're talking about, He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, Jesus who never sinned, even though He was tempted in all ways you and I are, He never sinned. And in spite of that, He was treated like the worst sinner to ever walk the face of the earth. Having the wrath of God poured out on Him on that cross. So that you and I who are great at sinning... I'm on sinning, the phone, asshole! Anyway, so what's that? You're on the phone. Well, go, go get in the room somewhere if you don't want the noise. Hey, this is no, no need to be rude. Don't be able name. You're right. It's a public area. You do know what the First Amendment is, right? Y'all do remember that? Free speech. That's right, free speech. Thank you. There's a Jesus came and suffered on the cross, taking the wrath of God that we deserve, so that we, sinners like you and I, and mockers, and those people whose phone calls are more important than hearing the gospel, if, through, if we repent and believe this gospel, put our faith in Christ, can be treated as though we had never sinned. And so, if you want to... The gospel in a sentence, go to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But a little more detail, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. So see, this gospel message is, is the same message that's been preached for thousands of years. It's a message that Jesus himself preached, that all his disciples preached, that all the believers, the preachers, between him and me and our time, preached. It's the same message. If, if someone preaches another message than this, the Bible says, let them be anathema, let them be cursed, because this is the gospel. Then Paul says this, he says, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. Now think about that. He, Paul delivered this gospel to the Corinthians, he said, that what? That he made up himself? No. That he came up with? No. It's the gospel that Paul himself received. You see, this gospel is not something that a man has conjured up in his mind. The gospel is, was given by God himself. So this is that gospel that Paul received, that he preached in the gospel that we preach even today, 2,000 plus years later. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He's referencing back the Old Testament prophecies, of course, again. Jesus died for our sins according to prophecy. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep or died. After that, He was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So there's the gospel. The death, burial, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And there's so much more to tell. That's just simplified, but there's so much more to tell. Like, what does that matter to you and I? How does that apply to us? Does it apply to us? Why should we care? He came and died and rose from the dead. So what? What's the big deal? Why do I need Him? Those are all good questions. Why do you need Jesus? Why should you care about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would Jesus come Himself and say, Repent and believe the gospel? Why have men for thousands of years continued to preach, Repent and believe the gospel? I would say that because that's the most important thing that you'll ever hear, bar none. The most important thing you can ever hear in your entire life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's not because we're saying it, it's because God said it. This is His message. We're simply, as Rich said earlier, we're simply His ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5 says we're His ambassadors, that we go out and we compel people to come into the kingdom. So we're here to compel you to consider the claims of Christ and to compel you to repent and believe this gospel. Like Jesus himself said, to repent and believe the gospel. But, but why does it matter? It might be a serious question. Why does this gospel even matter? Why are we still talking about Jesus 2,000 years later? Well, here's why. Because Jesus is God. The Bible says that all things were created by Him. Yes, Jesus. He's the Creator as well. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All things were created by Him and for Him. And nothing was created that was created without Him. In other words, He was involved in the entire creation process. He was there. The Godhead did it. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So this Jesus who is the Creator, is also going to be our judge. The Bible says the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. So we have the beginning, Jesus, our Creator. And the Bible says it is appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The judge is Jesus. So here He is, the bookends of our lives. Jesus is the bookends of our lives. He created us, and He's going to judge us. This is God. And He came and willingly sacrificed Himself on a Roman cross for His creation while we were yet His enemies, the Bible says still. And you're thinking, well, okay, so what? So still, how does that apply to me? Here's how it applies to you and me. See, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all great at sinning. We're so good at sinning because it's our very nature to rebel against God. We naturally sin. We can't help but sin. The Bible calls us slaves to sin. How did that come to be? Well, it came to be from the very beginning. Remember in Genesis when God created everything in six literal days? On day six, He took some dust. He uh, formed the body of Adam. He breathed life into Adam and made him a living soul, the Bible says, and put him in this garden, and he, he took uh, Adam, he, he made him go to sleep, took his rib, and created Eve, the first woman, the first marriage, one man, one woman, together, and put them in this garden, and told them they could freely eat of anything, any tree in the garden. Oh, great, a wonderful place. But God gave them one restriction, and said, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. So he gave them all these trees to eat from, save one. The only restriction, don't eat of that tree. And as human nature goes, Eve was tempted by Satan. She saw that this fruit of this tree looked good. So she took the fruit and she ate. She gave to Adam and he ate. And this is where sin entered the world. This is where the fall of man, the fall of humanity happened. It's when they disobeyed God. The, the sin wasn't in the fruit of the tree. The sin was their disobedience to their Creator, who had given them everything they needed for life. 
and gave them this one restriction and yet they they fell and they ate this fruit and that's when the Bible says sin entered into the world and you're thinking well, well that certainly doesn't have anything to do with me right it has everything to do with you and me because see I said remember they were the first man and woman the first marriage and we're all descendants of them no matter how hard it is to grasp that no matter how much you've been taught that we evolved from a puddle of slime over millions of years, the fact is that we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And because of that, we're all born with a sin nature. We're all born into sin. And so we naturally sin. So see, there's our problem. We're born with this problem. That's so all we all have in common. We're born with the same problem. That problem is sin. We're all transgressors against God's law. And that's the human problem. And that's why this gospel is so important to you. That's why this Jesus is so important to you. That's why you so desperately, even though you may not know it or realize it, you're, you so desperately need to hear this gospel more than you need to hear anything else on planet earth is because you have the same problem that I have that everybody that's ever lived everybody that's ever going to live has that's sin you're separated from your creator you're a rebel against God by nature that's the problem and the Bible says that it is appointed unto man wants to die and after this the judgment from the judge is Jesus too and he will judge us according to what? Is he going to judge us according to civil law? No. Is he going to judge us according to what we think is right or wrong? No. He's going to judge us according to his own righteousness. That's right. Remember, God created all things, including the law. He set the standard. He, he determined what is right and what is wrong. And he has the authority to do that because he is the creator. And so he's going to judge us according to his own righteousness. You say, well, what's that like? Well, he, like I said, he's given us everything we need to be saved, to be born again. And he's given us his law. You've all heard of the Ten Commandments, probably, maybe, I hope. But you can look in the law, which is really a mirror. The Bible says our schoolmaster teaching us that we're sinners. But you can look at it, and it's like looking in a mirror, and you can see yourself. That's a lot of the reason people don't like to look in it, because you see yourself. Think about the very first commandment it says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. That means unless you've had God first and foremost in your life, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, your entire life, that you violated that first commandment. What's the second one? The second one is you should not make yourself any graven images. We think of graven images and we think of little Buddhas, which are idols, which are need to be burned and smashed too. But you can create a God in your mind. It's a false idol. Many people have a false idol created in their mind. They call him Jesus. But he looks nothing like the, the Jesus of Scripture. A false idol. But let's, let's get a little closer to home. What's the ninth commandment? You should not bear false witness. Tell lies. We think lying in our society is no big deal. We, we lie to keep from hurting someone's feelings. We lie to stay out of trouble. We lie to make more money. We lie maybe to uh, get a better grade in school. We lie, 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 lie. Yeah, I mean, so we I think walk, it's no I big deal to, to tell lies. What does Revelation tell us? It says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. We'll go read that in a minute. So see, even lying is a big deal to God. A big deal to God. Let's look at another one that I'm sure is prominent here in this place. Commandment number seven says, you shall not commit adultery. What's adultery? Adultery is if married people go and have sex with someone they're not married to. Or vice versa, that's adultery. You know what Jesus said when he came? He kind of clarified that commandment, if you will, or, or magnified, I should say, that commandment. He says, if you look with lust, 
You're an adulterer at heart. See, God even judges our thought life. Just looking at another person with lustful sexual desire is sin. Who's not guilty of that? And even if you think, well, okay, maybe I've broken one or two commandments, but basically I'm a good person, right? Which most people think they are. If you ask them, well, you may be thinking that. Maybe you're thinking, hey, I've broken one or two, but hey, everybody does. So I'm okay. I'm pretty good. I haven't murdered anybody after all. But, but wait, but Jesus said if you have hatred in your heart, that you're a murderer at heart. And James tells us this. If there's any doubt left in your mind, James says that if you break one of the least commandments, that you're guilty of all. In other words, the only thing you must do to qualify yourself for an eternity in the lake of fire is tell one lie. And you're just as guilty before God as a mass murderer. Now in our eyes, that seems crazy, right? But remember, we're not God. God requires, as Rich said earlier, He requires perfection. That's His standard, perfection. And as you can see, if you're honest with yourself, none of us are perfect. So when the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we know it's true. Because all we have to do is go test ourselves and see that we are, in fact, sinners, rebels against our Creator. And that's our trouble. See, that's, that's our problem. We all have this sin problem. And that's why we're in big trouble. We got Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit who created all of us. Gave us planet Earth to live on. Gave us all we need to live godly lives. And yet we rebel against Him. We don't want God to tell us what to do. We want to be our own little gods. Or we want a religion that it appeals to us, a religion that is okay with our lifestyle. That's why there's over 4,000 known religions in the world, because man keeps conjuring up religions to suit himself. There's an old saying that says, in the beginning, God created man, and man quickly returned the favor. So see, there's many false images of God in people's minds. So Jesus is the creator. He created us, gave us everything we need to live a holy life to honor and glorify Him, yet we rebel against Him. We sin. And the Bible says that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire and the wages of sin is death. So there's the problem. Because we've all sinned, we all deserve to die and go to hell forever, to pay our sin debt. Because God is good, He will require payment for sin. And so that's our problem. But here's where... Jesus comes in as the Redeemer. See, he's our Creator. He's our Judge. But He's also our Redeemer. In other words, He's made a way that wretched sinners like me can be forgiven and have eternal life. When Jesus came, that's this Gospel, remember? The Gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Jesus came, was born of a virgin, walked planet Earth some 33 years, Never sinned in thought, word, or deed, even though he was tempted, and always you and I are, but he never sinned. In spite of that, he was arrested. He was beaten to the point of where you almost couldn't recognize him. He was beaten with his cat of nine tails where it, it ripped the flesh off his back. It was just like raw meat. His back was. And he was taken up to the hill of Golgotha, the hill of the skull, nailed to a Roman cross, Stood up being crucified between two criminals, dying a horrific death. And when he was on the cross, he had the wrath of the Father poured out on him for sin. The Bible says that he became sin. He didn't become a sinner. He became sin for us. Even to the point where the Father turned his back on him. And Jesus cried out and said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? This is your Creator that did this, taking the punishment you and I deserve so that we could be forgiven. So Jesus died there on that cross. He was taken down. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And if that had been the end of the story, we wouldn't be here right now talking about Him. You see, that wasn't the end. 
See, on the third day, three days later, see, that, that tomb was empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. Just like He said He would. You destroy this temple in three days, I will build it back. I will come back. Jesus rose from the dead, defeating death and proving He was God. And you may be thinking, hey, nobody's ever risen from the dead. Jesus did. And He proved it. As we read, He was seen by hundreds of people after the resurrection. He walked planet earth for some 40 days after He rose from the dead, teaching His disciples about the things of the kingdom. And there's no written record that I know of of any, anybody really disputing the fact that He rose from the dead. And again, it was a very public thing. It wasn't done in secret. He was publicly beaten. He was publicly crucified. He was taken out. He was buried. They put a stone in front of the tomb. They put a seal on it. They put a guard on it. And in spite of all of that, on the third day, the tomb was empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. It's a historical fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. And the Bible says that now He is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for His children. So when Jesus rose from the dead proving He was God, What's that? Do you have a question? Okay. God bless you. So Jesus came and sacrificed Himself willingly, the Bible says, on this cross, taking that punishment we deserve because we're all sinners and we can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough to save ourselves. We can't do anything to save ourselves. That's why Jesus came preaching to repent, to believe the gospel, to preach repentance, to believe in the gospel. That's what He did. That's what He commands us to do. That's why we do it. Because the only way to have your sins forgiven, the only way to be made right with God, is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So remember Jesus, we see He's the Creator, we see He's the Redeemer, he, He's the propitiation for our sins, He came in. When He redeemed us, what that really means is He purchased us back. He paid the price to buy us back to Himself. But now let's look at Jesus the Judge. And this is for those who will be many, I'm afraid, who reject Jesus Christ, who reject His offer of salvation through repentance and faith. But guess what? No matter whether you believe in Jesus and trust Him or not, you will stand before Him in judgment. We all will. It's in uh, Revelation 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and Him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Did you get that? The dead, small and great. No matter how rich you are, how poor you are, you're going to stand before God in judgment. It says, And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And don't miss this. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's what awaits those who die in their sin, those who refuse to bow the knee, who refuse to turn from sin and, and trust Christ, those who don't repent and believe this gospel, that's what they have to look forward to. is eternity in the lake of fire. You say, well, well, why is that? That doesn't seem fair. Well, it's fair because God is good. That sounds strange, doesn't it? To say that it's right for people who die in their sin to go to the lake of fire forever. That it's right because God is good. Think about it. God is good. He's morally excellent. He's perfect. And because of His goodness, He will punish sinners because He will not violate His own character. To not punish sin would make Him corrupt. Just like it would an earthly judge if, if He didn't punish murderers and adulterers. We would call Him corrupt. And God is not corrupt, therefore He will have payment for sin. 
And so either you'll bow the knee, trust Christ, and what He did on the cross when He received the wrath of God will be counted as payment for your sin debt, and you'll be your sin will be wiped clean. You'll be given a new heart with new desires. You'll be born again, redeemed to your Creator, and your sin debt is paid for. Or you can go about walking through life without Jesus Christ, and the Bible says that when you do that, your story of wrath for the day of wrath. So you're not really getting away with anything. We're not living in a more enlightened society, maybe a more sinful society. But just because we parade sin up and down the street, just because the government accommodates sin, legalizes sin, that doesn't change it. It's still sin. So while you think you're getting away with stuff, you're not really. You're just storing up wrath for the day of wrath. Why? Because God is patient. God is kind. God is loving. And God doesn't desire that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. So you're not getting away with anything. These books we just read about, what are those books for? It's God's record books. He keeps a record. He knows everything we've done. He knows every thought you've ever had. And He'll even judge those according to His righteousness. So if you refuse to bow the knee in this life, repent, trust Christ, you're bound for the lake of fire. It's a promise of God. And He always keeps His promises. But if you do repent, put your faith in Jesus Christ, believe this gospel, that Jesus came and sacrificed Himself willingly for sinners and rose from the dead, put your faith in Him, here's what's in store for you. Because now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these, things, these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now listen to this. We're going back to this contrast between believers and unbelievers. He says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And friends, we don't want you to go to this lake of fire. You see, there's, there's two options here if you want to look at it that way. You can bow the knee, repent, believe the gospel, trust Jesus, have your sin debt wiped away, paid in full, have eternal life in heaven with God where He'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. Or, you can reject the offer, continue to walk your own way, doing your own thing, and end up in the lake of fire. Because your sin debt has to be paid. And if you don't accept the offer that Jesus gives you to pay that debt for you, you get to go pay it yourself. That's it. It's either, it's either Jesus or the lake of fire. That's the only two options. See, there's no purgatory if you're a Catholic. Purgatory doesn't exist. The Bible never speaks of purgatory. There's no place where you go when you die and you, you work off your sin debt and then you go to heaven. That's unbiblical, untrue. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment, which we just read about. So don't fall into these false beliefs. You say, well, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? What, what religion is true? What religion is false? 
It's easy. It's easy to know. How do you know Christianity is true and all other religions are false? I don't even know what all other religions there are, but I can tell you emphatically that they're all false. You say, well, that's kind of arrogant. How do you know that? How can you say that? I can say that because Jesus himself said this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You see, Jesus made it exclusive. He is the only way. He is the gate. He is the door. If you don't come through that door, you don't come in at all. The Bible says that narrow is the path that leads to redemption, but broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. But folks, I beg you, get on the narrow path. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. And going back to the, the idea that, that, well, our society is more open now, more accepting of everything now, so we're becoming more enlightened. Yeah. And we, we think that's God's blessing on what we do on our society. Woo. We think it's just a blessing on fornication, on drunkenness, oh, on homosexuality. Woo. But it's not. Read Romans 1, start in verse 18, and you'll see what's really happening. Here we go. I'll read it for you. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There's the beginning of the problem. We suppress this truth. So we all know that God exists. We all know that we're accountable to God. He has written His law on our heart. We know right from wrong, but we suppress that truth. How do we do that? What does that look like? Well, it might be mockery, laughter, jokes, making light of it. But we suppress that truth because we love sin and want nobody to tell us what to do. It says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So He has revealed Himself through creation, so that you have no excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So what was God's response? It says, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. A lot of that going on. To exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason... How you doing? What is... What is... What is what? What is... 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 So for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. I wonder what that's talking about, huh? Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. So see, this, this enlightened society we think we live in is really God turning us over to more sin. When God allows you to go on down that sin road, He doesn't send a lightning bolt to strike you dead. It could be His wrath. He's just giving you over to more sin according to what Romans says here. And even as they did not like to retain God of their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, 
who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So don't be don't be deceived into thinking. What's that? Why are you so judgmental? Why are you so judgmental? No, I won't be doing that tonight. See, even though we, we see and we think that God is okay with our sins sometimes, it's really God just turning us over to more sin and more sin. So don't be tricked into thinking because He's not striking you dead. That He's okay with your sin because He's not. We can, we, we can tell you and urge you to be born again, to repent and, and trust Christ. Believe this gospel. Think about it. Your, your, think about it. Your Creator, your Creator, gave Himself for you. I appreciate the affirming of the Scripture, young man, because the Bible tells us that in the last days scoffers and mockers will come. So thanks for exhibiting that for us. We see here in Athens a lot, folks, the Bible being lived out, lived out in front of us. You know, speaking of worldview, we all have a worldview, right? How do you know a worldview is correct? There's many worldviews. There's a worldview that we're not even really here, that we just think we are. There's a worldview. How do you know a worldview is correct? Well, you look out into reality and see if it matches, see if it aligns with reality. That's how you know if your worldview is correct. If you have a biblical worldview, guess what? You look out into reality and you see it right before you. From cover to cover, you see it before you. You see the creation that reveals God. The Bible says in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see the creation. What do we see? Do we see a big cosmic accident, an explosion, when nothing exploded and became everything? How ridiculous is that? But that's the prominent theory of how we came to be, is that nothing exploded and became everything. How ridiculous is that? To see naturalistic evolution worldview doesn't align with reality. It's a farce. It's a fairy tale. But the scripture says that God spoke these things into existence because he is all powerful. And that's what we see. We see design. We see creativity. We see energy. We see all this stuff that just screams creator. That's why Romans tells us that that all His invisible attributes are clearly seen through the creation. He has given you everything you need to see that He is real. He's even written His law in your heart. And by that you know He's real. That's not a product of evolution. You don't have compassion on the less fortunate because you're a product of evolution. If you were, you wouldn't care. Survival of the fittest, right? So see, the Christian worldview in the beginning matches perfectly with what you see in reality. Then all through the scripture we see about human beings rebelling against God, sinning against God, going against Him, over and over and over again. And what do we see in reality? The same thing is being exhibited right here before us. There's scoffers and mockers like the Bible says. There's adulterers, there's... There's homosexuals, there's lesbians, there's drunkards, there's murderers, there's thieves. And all of this, the Bible tells us there, there's going to be. So this, this Christian worldview makes sense when you look in reality. So you can look at that, and all that makes sense, and all that using your common sense, your reason. You can reason out that if that's so, if that's true, then guess what? When God says He's going to come and judge us, we can bank on that being true as well. So tonight, we want to encourage you to repent and believe the gospel. Encourage you to not check your brain at the door. It's not a blind faith. We want to encourage you to check it out. The Bible says, God said, come let us reason together. Use your reason that God gave you. Don't be a sheep. Don't just believe whatever somebody puts in your brain and spew that out and think that's true. Find out for yourself. Don't go to the institution of higher education and become more stupid than you were when you got here. 
Use your common sense, use your brain, and see if these things are true. We're not used car salesmen. I'm not trying to talk you in to anything. We're simply ambassadors of Jesus Christ or his, his agents to come and to tell you this good news and to compel you, to urge you to be redeemed to your Creator through repentance and faith in Christ. So check it out. I pray that you will repent and trust the Savior.